now we will move on to the topic of today, search and rescue operations in the Mediterranean. I will just set up the framework and let our speakers, as well as you participants, uh, feed the conversation because you are the experts of this topic. So uh, SAR operations are a relatively recent field. It's uh, less than 10 years old, as you might well know. Um, there are a few big players, meaning there are a few big organizations operating in the Mediterranean and many smaller civil society initiatives. So again, many actors, quite recent fields. Um, there's a structural lack of coordination among actors. Again, it's not an established um, sector and many things change constantly, as I'm sure you will see when we talk about the legal framework. Um, we can say there's a lack of prof professionalization. There's uh, unpaid volunteers, grassroots activists not that come with non-humanitarian backgrounds. So it's like any field where um, nothing is set in stone yet. Um, a lot of people get involved, um, which means that profiles are also very diverse and which also means that there's no common language yet among the, the actors and um, the people involved. And um, our two cents in this as the CCHN, um, we organized a um, what we call a negotiation workshop. So this is, um, let's say, one of our standard activities at the CCHN, um, where we brought together uh, people who work on search and rescue operations in the Mediterranean, and we um, equip them with our own negotiation, humanitarian negotiation methodology. Um, this workshop uh, took place in Rome uh, in October of last year, and it was a very interesting pilot project, so to speak, where, again, we brought together these um, humanitarian professionals working in these missions to see how um, negotiations happen in these uh, in this specific context and how and what kind of skills are still required um, to help the humanitarians uh, working in this sector. So again, this is a very uh, brief framework, but we will uh, delve deeper during our conversation. So I'm going to introduce our first two speakers Maria Gabrielsen Jumbert and Christina Röpstoff. Just a very brief uh, introduction. They are senior researchers at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, Norway. Um, Christina is currently working on a research project called Red Lines and Gray Zones, Ethical Dilemmas in Humanitarian Negotiation. She has held positions at various universities and think tanks and again, her research focus on, focuses on humanitarian action, peace building, and forced migration. Uh, Maria's research focuses on humanitarian and security interfaces in the European borderlands and how they influence each other. From European migration and border management policies to humanitarian and citizens' responses to uh, the reception crisis in countries like Greece, and from France and Norway. Welcome, Maria and Christina. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna, um, for your introduction and for inviting us uh, to speak today. As you just mentioned, uh, Maria and myself, we have been working on humanitarian action, search and rescue, and uh, especially Maria on border management for some time now. And um, in our current research, we kind of teamed up <laughs> within our broader research project that you mentioned red lines and gray zones, ethical dilemmas in humanitarian negotiations. Uh, as the title already says, we look at ethical dilemmas um, that arise for humanitarian practitioners in different contexts. And the research project looks at it both theoretically to try to better understand and you know, map them, and also find strategies how to deal with them. But then also uh, we have uh, different empirical cases we look at to get a more in-depth understanding. 
of these negotiations and the ethical dilemmas. Maria and I, we work on the central Mediterranean and search and rescue and the ethical dilemmas that arise in that context. And what is striking from our research so far is that this that the case um, of SAR in the central Mediterranean were sharing many features with other humanitarian sites, also when it comes to the dilemmas and the situations, yeah. It shows also some particularities um, that also our interview partners that we have conducted, and uh, we have conducted several interviews, um, they and especially the ones that have experience elsewhere in other humanitarian sectors have pointed out these differences, uh, the space for negotiation and the, uh, and the humanitarian space of the Mediterranean and for conducting SAR. Um, so that is maybe something we can also address later, uh, also maybe in, um, when we talk to the practitioners that have more insight on this. Um, when we look at it, um, we think that this stems on the one hand from the peculiarities of the sea as a humanitarian space. Um, and though the phenomenon of maritime migration and humanitarian concerns about so-called boat people is surely nothing new. And we, you know, we might remember the boat people that flew from Vietnam War in the 1970s. Yeah? So we have this continuous, like we have migration. We have people in just, uh, distress at sea, and we have uh, humanitarian concerns and responses to it in the central Mediterranean later since the 90s. I totally agree what you said. It seems to be not a very well established practice yet, not very coordinated. Yeah? And we see that there are practices emerging, including how to conduct negotiations in that particular space. Now, what makes this space particular is um, also linked to the kind of factors that are involved. We will say a little bit more later about that, but also the particular legal frameworks that apply and, you know, um, the way the, the ocean and the seas are also divided in search and rescue zones um, and certain policy frameworks. And Maria is now going to say a little bit more about the particular legal frameworks and this kind of environment, this, uh, these negotiations occur. Indeed, thank you so much, uh, Christina, for, for setting the stage of, of uh, the, the, the research that we have been conducting together here. So I'll say a little bit about um, these overlapping uh, and different legal frameworks that uh, apply at sea and, and how they apply. Uh, I guess this is familiar to, to many here, but I think it's also important for us to to, to, to sort of yeah, remind of to set the stage uh, for our, our discussion. So as Christina said, uh, this is um, a particular kind of humanitarian setting for uh, and which we will qualify as a humanitarian arena and a humanitarian situation at the same time as it's not one of an armed conflict. So international humanitarian law, for instance, does not apply since it's not an armed conflict. Yet we have, of course, human uh, rights law will always apply. And then we have the international law of the sea that applies here, uh, which is what defines the parameters of uh, the obligation to bring search and rescue that I'll say a little bit more about now. And then we also have um, international refugee law. And how does that intersect uh, in this context, which I will also say a little bit uh, about. How do you, how do you, uh, how does the law of the sea intersect with refugee law and the more specifically the principle of non uh, refoulement because these are different legal regimes uh, that should also be seen as distinct for for good reasons here but they're also in in some ways that they they are cross cutting here that I'll I'll come back to uh, in a minute but first and foremost the under the, um, the UN convention of the law of the sea the obligation to bring search and rescue to any vessel in distress at sea is, is described. So this is an obligation for any vessel uh, out uh, at uh, uh, sea, no matter which search and rescue zone or international waters they may find themselves in. So no matter where they are, any vessel has an obligation to bring search and rescue to uh, another one uh, that is in a distress situation. 
so, so if they come across this other vessel in distress, they have this obligation. And what is important to remind of there as well is that this is irrespective of where this um, vessel that is in distress, no matter where it comes from, no matter why they have ended up in this uh, situation of distress, and no matter where they are heading. So, so in, um, irrespective of their both nationality and where they are heading, and uh, why they have uh, why they are in this instance seeking to cross the Mediterranean uh, do, does not have anything to say for this obligation to bring rescue. So it is about the, the duty to rescue uh, human life uh, at sea. And in order for a rescue operation to be completed, um, the, the, the the rescuers need to bring those who have been rescued back to a safe harbor. And this should be sort of the, the nearest safe harbor. Um, and, and that's where some of the discussions have, have started. Where is, what is a safe harbor and what would be the nearest one? Um, and here it's, and, and where European um, uh, member states uh, and uh, Frontex and, uh, and uh, national search and rescue agencies have also wanted to promote uh, the, the fact of bringing um, rescued migrants to other non-European uh, ports and arguing that they would be safe harbors. But, uh, the, and this is where, um, what I said initially, that um, that uh, the law of the sea and refugee law should be seen as two distinct uh, legal mechanisms. So when out at sea, what matters is just that the those lives in distress need to be rescued. So any processing of whether these people have a right to international protection, a right to refugee protection, for instance, does not, in a way, is not a relevant question out at sea. That cannot be uh, processed and, and answered out in a risky situation at sea. That should be addressed by what we, in the legal terms, refer to as the, the competent authorities on land. Um, yet, uh, a European vessel, um, means whether this is a, a NGO-led vessel um, with a European flag or a Frontex vessel, then th that means that the those on board are under that country's jurisdiction. So it's under European jurisdiction, which in turn means that they need to uh, uh, abide by the international refugee law and cannot bring those who have been rescued back to either a port in Libya or another port outside of Europe, for instance, in Tunisia or elsewhere, where if they would define that as a safe harbor. One might easily argue that, for instance, a port in uh, Libya might not be a safe harbor because of the situation in Libya. But then even bringing it, uh, migrants to another harbor that some might argue is is physically safe from from um, uh, or or secure, uh, the fact of bringing them then outside of Europe means that there's a risk of uh, refoulement of the people on board because we don't yet know if they are going to apply for asylum, have, uh, have a right to apply for asylum and may potentially also have the right to, to protection. So by, by simply by then bringing them to, to uh, a port outside of Europe, that might uh, be an act of collective expulsion and, uh, and refoulement. So, um, yes, I, I think I'll keep it, keep it to that for, for now to, to sort of set the, set the stage that, that the, the, there are some things that uh, uh, then need to be uh, taken into account to complete the, the rescue operation at sea. And, and that is then to, to bring people back to a safe uh, harbor. And as long as these are European vessels, that needs to be a re European harbor. And then the assessment of whether the people on board are going to apply for asylum or have a right to protection that should be then assessed by by competent authorities thereafter i'll let it over to you christina for the yes. next points so thank you maria so we know a little bit about the legal framework and we know laws they need to be interpreted so of course there's some controversies uh, about certain you know definitions what is a safe harbor and all that but and that is the crucial um, aspect here, this all happens in a certain political climate, right? We have certain policies and a political climate in place, which we have to take into account to understand this 
sea and the search and rescue in this particular humanitarian setting, right? So this all happens in a climate in which the EU and national governments' approaches have increasingly focused on deterrence of migration and border control, right? Um, rather than protection of people. And maybe this is not a particular particularity of this space. <laughs> I think we see that also in other migration contexts, right? But of course, the laws that apply, the loopholes that are there, the um, space for negotiation and the actors involved differ, right? Um, the um, What is also very, very interesting and important to to look at is that these uh, attitudes and approaches and the policies, of course, have changed over time. We saw more conducive, better environment, um, maybe up until 2014, I would say, also when Italy had Mara Mostrom and all that, but later and now getting more and more um, difficult, right, in this political climate of let's say, anti-migration <laughs> sentiments. And in general, I would say there, we can, we can observe this tension between humanitarian sentiments and the humanitarian imperative to uh, you know, save lives and reduce suffering and uh, the solidarity with people on the move versus this um, increasing hostili hostility towards migrants and uh, the you know upkeeping of borders and all that fortress europe you know all this uh, buzzwords uh, which is often instrumentalized by certain political parties uh, especially pop in populist uh, parties right and these changes over time in our um, case we look at italy mainly and the central mediterranean route right we see this in italy and how um, the approach has also changed over time um, understands also with changing governments, right? Um, so, and by the latest Italian governments, the one now, the one before, um, continuously seek, I would say, very creative ways of obstructing, especially the work of civilian search and rescue, right? Um, it needs to be mentioned, and I want to mention it here, that in contrast to Malta, for example, the Maritime Rescue Coordination Center, the MRCC in Rome, is at least still responding to distress calls. <laughs> so we have this setting, you know, within Europe where there is um, different ways of seeking to control migration, to for border surveillance and all that, and at the same time, the humanitarian crisis that unfolds at the Mediterranean and at disembark uh, disembarkation points, right? Um, now, I already mentioned that I, I don't want to go into detail there, but we already heard that there are smaller and bigger actors involved. I just now mentioned the MRCC in Rome, but I mean, all the coastal states have their own uh, maritime rescue coordination center. So that is very, very important. And this is an act that we don't have in other settings. <laughs> uh, this is very particular to the maritime space. Um, we also have um, the important role of the Coast Guard yeah, that have always played a very um, positive role, I would say, most, most times in rescuing lives at sea. And we have a lot of NGOs that have filled the vacuum, the void that was left after Mare Nostrum um, and, you know, with this deterrence policy of member states and coastal states, not... Um, not rescuing people. Um, we have to also, of course, in this context, mention Frontex, the European Coast Guard and Border Agency, which claimingly has a humanitarian aspect, but generally is has the main task of border surveillance, right? And the monitoring of rescue areas. But we also have private vessels. As Maria mentioned, every vessel that is there and sees uh, people in distress has to uh, rescue them, yeah? there's this legal obligation. So this can also, uh, ref you know, um, be uh, for private, like cruise ships or fishermen. Yeah. So we have a lot of different actors involved there, um, but also in order to comprehend the environment in which um, humanitarian action and SAR takes place in that particular space, but also the negotiations 
for access, um, we have to take the actors into account that operate on land, right? We have to look at the governments, the ministries, the parliaments, the EU, but also the broader public uh, with uh, certain, um, the media maybe also, right? Uh, that um, also play a role in forming that space. Yeah. Now, within that space and the political climate, what we have is an ever more reduced access to the people distressed at sea. Yeah. So there is this um, various ways, um, restrictive policies, decrees, whatever we see, to obstruct especially civilian search and rescue to access the people at sea, uh, the stress at sea. Yeah? And in different ways this is being done. They use, there are many legal channels that are being used, right? Uh, the criminalization of, of um, search, search and rescue. Um, there are um, administrative hurdles, uh, there are smear campaigns and also uh, leading up to physical threats. And I think uh, Juan and also later Barbara can maybe better um, talk about the experience. And we saw last weekend the tragic episode with the geoparents, right? Uh, so I think we will learn more about that, the many ways that this is obstructed. And this, in this context, right, that's where negotiations for access and protections are happening with this kind of actors, the legal frameworks and this political environment. And uh, Maria, maybe now briefly, sorry for taking this time, but um, you can say something about the dilemmas that may occur in this kind of context. Absolutely. And perhaps in, in particular, picking up from uh, from what you, you outlined, what we have seen in our in uh, our recent um, interviews and exchanges with uh, with different um, uh, actors operating as uh, with with uh, search and rescue vessels um is the, the um is how the italian decree that was um put into uh practice in the beginning of 2023 uh that uh, that indicates that every um uh, search and rescue vessel can only conduct one rescue operation at a time uh, so that if they have rescued a smaller vessel or a larger one, then they should immediately head back to the port that they are being given. Um, and uh, whereas the NGO-led vessels often have the capacity, once someone is uh, a group of uh, people have been rescued from a distress situation, they may still be uh, it, it, they may be safe on the on the uh, on the NGO vessel. And they may still have the capacity and the time to, to rescue others that are either along their journey or without too much deviation. But since they're being asked to go straight back to, to the, the harbor they are being assigned, um, and they are increasingly also being asked to, to travel even further, to not go to the nearest harbor, but to uh, they are being assigned harbors for, further north in Italy. And that puts them in a direct dilemma of um, of uh, sort of in between respecting the, the law of the sea of with the, where they might have the possibility and capacity, but also obligation to rescue others that are nearby them, in uh, and and sort of having to balance that with this Italian uh, decree now that they are being asked to go straight back uh, to Italy. Uh, but it, and this is not only a, a sort of an ethical or legal dilemma of, of weighing the the Italian law that they are sort of operating within versus the international law that of course is uh, uh, ranked above uh, the the, uh, the um, this Italian decree. But it also is a practical dilemma because if they uh, act against uh, the, the the orders in a way of the of the Italian authorities, they risk also being detained or being stopped and prevented from going back out at sea again, uh, which, uh, so which puts them in the practical dilemma of further rescuing uh, other distress situations here and now uh, versus the possibility or then being prevented from conducting further search and rescues in the medium and longer uh, run. And we've seen now that the geobarents uh, 
vessel um, used by MSF has been detained for 20 more uh, days now, just uh, very recently. But I'm sure we'll hear, hear more about as well. And according to an SOS Humanity report uh, in, twen uh, in 2023, uh, these vessels spent uh, 374 uh, additional days making these longer journeys than they would have if they were just going to the nearest uh, nearest harbor. Uh, so this puts the humanitarian organizations again uh, in front of this dilemma between the here and now and, and the longer run and, and which uh, which principles and um, um, yeah legal frameworks to to refer to. Uh, a very short comment to, to finish up with as well is that uh, we, we see also that this situation of, of an, uh, administrative restrictions on, on the vessels being allowed to go back out at sea, this Italian decree asking them to go further away, this is a, a, a landscape uh, uh, in, in which it is also more di difficult to mobilize public and media attention. There is, in general, perhaps less public and media attention than there was a couple of years ago around the situation in the Mediterranean. But what we also hear is that it's it is it is less easy to to generate an understanding of of what uh, what the, uh, is kind of uh, difficulty this puts the SAR NGOs in, as opposed to the more sort of spectacular standoff situations uh, during the Salvini days, where some of the NGO vessels were not allowed. To, to, to dock into the Italian harbors, which generated quite a bit of media attention. And we may also wonder if the current way of operating is also in the interest of, of the Italian authorities of maybe letting a few more vessels in with the rescued migrants, but making it more and more difficult to operate at sea. So sort of a politics of exhaustion of, over time, uh, rather than having these very highly mediatized uh, uh, situations. And looking forward to hearing what, what also others here have experienced in, in this uh, setting. So leaving over to the next speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina and Maria, for setting up the framework, explaining the context of the search and rescue operations. Um, now we will hear from Juan uh, Matias Gil who will talk more about the real experiences coming directly from um, these operations. Just to briefly introduce Juan, he has 15 years experience in the humanitarian sector, working as a project manager and country director with Médecins Sans Frontières, mostly in acute emergency phases of armed conflict. He has experience in the Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Iraq, South Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Uh, Juan has extensive knowledge on migration context and a strong expertise in search and rescue activities where he has worked since 2015. He is currently responsible for MSF search and rescue operations in the central Mediterranean with a strong focus on institutional representation and advocacy. Juan, we're very happy to have you here over to you to hear about the realities of humanitarians in these operations. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Thank you for the presentation and to Christina and, and Maria. Um, as you said, I, I've been working in, in this context uh, in and out for quite some years now, since the beginning of the intervention by the by the civil society organization and, and our best. So I went through um, mostly all the all the different phases that this uh, that this context uh, went through up to now, you know, with the very difficult situation that we are having. And um, Christina and Maria mentioned that our our, our vessel Giovanni have just been detained after going through a, another difficult situation last last week uh, with the Libyan Coast Guard. Last, last weekend. So basically the, the history of, of SAR and our activity, our access and our respective negotiation changed along the time. No? Since the beginning in the years 2015, 16, um, some part of the 17, we were part of a system uh, that was centralized by, by the MRCC Rome, the coordination center, Italian coordination center. So everything was going quite well. Let's see, it was a system where our vessels were integrating together with the commercial vessels, military vessels, 
uh, Coast Guard, etc. So we were basically rescuing the people that the Italian authorities were sending us there. The other, the coordinates, we were going there, uh, rescuing, maybe putting together all the people rescued the same day in the vessels who could go to the to the continent or to Sicily, and then another ones were staying uh, patrolling the, the area where normally we were finding the distress. So uh, even there were many deaths also in those days uh, with so many arrivals, almost 200,000 uh, arrivals in, in 2016. We could say that the system was well organized and it was, it was working. At that time, uh, we were seen as a, a partner or somebody complementing the, the efforts of, a, of the Italian Coast Guard uh, in, the, in their duty to, to save life. Of course, everything changed in 2017 when the Italian Coast Guard withdrew from the, from the area after the creation of the, of the Libyan Coast Guard, giving the Libyan Coast Guard big responsibility in an area that they, so far and they are totally not able to to cover and of course the interest uh, to rescue people is is far different uh, so in 2017 we went through a very difficult situation in mm, experiencing the gap in the search and rescue uh, uh, system at sea and also on the other side is this defamation that we started having you know, in, in these accusations still unfounded after seven years that we were colluding with the smugglers uh, and, and traffickers. So on one side, we need to find a way to operate in an efficient way, just following our social mission. And on, on the other ones, we need to defend publicly about this uh, deliberate defamation that, that we were suffering. Uh, of course, none of these accusations were were proved. Uh, we are reaching the end of the pre-trial phase of the of the Trapani case, the so-called uh, Juventa case in in Trapani, and uh, most likely it's going to be filed after seven years of permanent uh, attack for all the organizations that the three organizations that are taking part of of this trial. But this tells you. This is a little bit the environment that we have lived for these seven years. Uh, this one in the public sphere and also the the obstruction that, that we are facing since then uh, at sea. We see that year after year, the humanitarian space is being reduced, is, is shrinking uh, at sea, and we are fighting for, for it. Now, when we started doing this activity, we thought that we were going to have a quite a fast solution after advocating for a, a search and rescue mechanism as it used to be Mare Nostrum with a clear mandate of, of saving lives and also in the in the in the ambition of, of creating safer legal channels for people to avoid using this route. And surely we were over optimistic at, uh, at that time and now we end up not focusing in this one, we still push and believe in in this cause, but now we are really defending our our operational space, not because we we think that we are the the center of the problem, but if, if we don't defend our operational space, we cannot really save lives. That is is that said the need is still there. The people continue to depart, and they continue, unfortunately, to to die at sea. So our efforts now nowadays uh, are, are are focusing that one uh, and our negotiations um, situations evolve all along this year. No? Um, so of course, in in in, in this situation, uh, let's say as I was saying before at the beginning, we were having the Italians who were guiding us. Libyan Coast Guard was already there with a few vessels. They were coming around, but they were not a, a, a big issue. And now they became a big problem, no? because they they were created to intercept people at sea and to take them back to Libya in this, uh, in this strategy, European strategy, to, to deter uh, people on the move, trying to reach the their coast, uh, so they became more fit with more assets, with no, more technology, with more presence, 
uh, and really creating a, a competition among us and who's going to be the one rescuing the people. On one side, we will rescue them and take them uh, to safety. Uh, on the other side, they will rescue them and send them back to the cycle of abuse that they are experiences, experiencing in Libya, but not only because we have seen also in the last year a big increase of people living from, from Tunisia and all the harassment and the attacks that they have suffered, uh, especially during last year, uh, all the sub-Saharan uh, migrants in, 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 in Tunisia. So, of course, uh, our negotiation spaces and situation changed along these years. The first year, they were quite easy, I would say. We were having an open dialogue with the with institutions in, in Italy. We were meeting them regularly. We were trying to optimize our resources and our capacities. And the most difficult negotiation that we could run at that time was probably they were sending us to Palermo and we were asking to go to Trapani because we were having our base there. So then we can, and then we could do our arrangements. And the dialogue was here. There was reasonable grounds uh, at that time to discuss. Uh, and this, at one point, uh, it was over. No? Uh, Cristina or Maria mentioned the, uh, the period of the standoff that started with Salvini closing the ports and one of our vessels going to, to Valencia in Spain. Uh, of course, this opened a new era in on our operations, our positioning, and uh, our negotiations. Because of course, it was a direct confrontation, trying to put the the good ones at the bad ones over there, the places in the bad ones. So, as I said before, we need to try and and, and change our image that was totally different uh, one year before. Uh, so this requires a big effort, and also operating at sea and trying to get the the port, no. The, the standoff period was a tough one in terms of negotiation and trying to get a, a port that didn't end up with the government where Salvini was taking place in Italy. This, this continued for another, uh, another couple of years with a different government in place. So we, now we remember, or we, of course, we are suffering the, the right wing parties, but even with the, with, with the PD, uh, in in the Democratic Party in Italy, the things were not uh, much better, no, and they are a center left uh, uh, party. So the standoff continue with the uh, with the additional uh, challenge that we were not news anymore because they were not trying to look for a for an open confrontation. So. Uh, negotiating with the government was even difficult in that period because um, nobody was caring because they were not in the news, they were not in the newspaper. So, of course, they were having a, a, a nice cover over there and it was very difficult to reach the, the offices, knocking the doors of the, of, of the policy makers or the ones who were implementing at that time. So, uh, but still there was some space of of negotiations over there. Uh, of course, nowadays uh, with this new new government, the 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 operational space is really reduced because of the regulations that the Italian put in place um, and that we are challenging in court uh, with several several cases. Uh, in the meantime, we try to continue our search and rescue the activities at sea. We try to maximize the the people that we rescue, even with this rule, uh, ridiculous rule of only one rescue. Sometimes we manage to 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 rescue more people without um, without punishment or without consequences. Uh, always trying to coordinate with them with a permanent and difficult negotiation with them. Um, and then, uh, of course, always with this ghost that also Christine and Maria were mentioning of the detention. And that is always there. And even now that we are detained, we know that it's a totally illegitimate uh, uh, detention that even they, they, they are alleging things that they are totally false. So no, no proven uh, basis to... To, to detain us, of course, we are uh, we are appealing this decision. So now we, we are not anymore in the in the moment of, of 
discussing or negotiating with the with the policy makers. If not, we are going directly to the justice because and the doors are totally closed. No, because the, it, this is feeding their their narrative, their public narrative uh, that they want so many votes and um, following following it. So now uh, let's say we cannot open a dialogue. We try to open a dialogue, but they don't want to dialogue with us, uh, and we need to to go to the court. So. Um, of course, I didn't mention the, the the moments that we were taken, or I didn't mention in detail the moments that we were taken to courts. No, I, I think they are around 20, 20 court cases, and if I'm not wrong, eighteen they are closed, and one is going to be closed very, very soon. So, of course, it was an absolute campaign uh, against uh, the, the civil society organizations. Uh, and lastly. Of course, we are facing this situation with the with the Libyan Coast Guard at, at sea. Now, you saw probably last last week and last Saturday we were having this situation that they came, they interrupted the the rescue, intimidating the 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 survivors, threatening uh, our 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 staff, uh, trying to board even in uh, one of our ribs. So. Um, uh, the situation and this competition with the with the Libyan actors, uh, that is not only the Libyan Coast Guard, because also you have the NGACs, you have non-state actors uh, with with vessels and, and weapons uh, at sea. So we need to be prepared to to negotiate with them. So we need to be prepared to negotiate in every level, at uh, central level or on land with the policymakers. The people who are taking the decisions, the main decisions on board our vessel from the bridge of command and the, the first line uh, workers and rescuers, uh, they end up being face to face with the with the Libyan Coast Guard, very aggressive, armed, etc. And of course, they need on one side to take care of their safety uh, and on the other one to uh, to to follow the objective and not abandon people at sea as it happened the other day that and they interrupted our rescue half of the people were on board the other one were in the boat in distress so after two hours we managed to get everybody uh, on board so um, uh, th these are the complexities nowadays and and we don't see also in the in the near future that this is going to be uh any better so of course we we get ready we know our our challenges and now we are detained we are once again challenging this in court and we we expect for the best to to have our detention lifted if not we will continue the the, the court case uh aiming for a positive outcome but of course the, the all, all the tools that we use in court they take a longer period or a, a result is going to come much afterwards and nobody is going to remember the positive result that we get. No, they are going to uh, remember the problem that we have. And in the meantime, we are detained. This is a detention number 20 of the civil society vessels. So and more than, than one year, uh, one of our vessels were were blocked. And Okay, not to mention all the all the kilometers that Maria and Christina said that we did uh, last year uh, to go to the faraway ports where we are disembarking people. Also, entitling uh, very difficult negotiation that so far we are we are losing. So not very optimistic uh, my intervention, but this is only the, a reflect of the of the reality that we are experiencing. Thank you.